Hi, this is Stephen Mead, lifelong entrepreneur, business owner, and global speaker. Over the years, I've read hundreds of books and spent thousands of hours developing what I call the bullseye belief system. And I've used that system to develop my own companies, as well as help others learn to be specific, targeted, and focused to get exactly what they want in life. Again, I'm Stephen Mead, and this is the Bullseye Guy Podcast. Steve and me back again with another Bullseye Guy podcast, and today's going to be a lot of fun. We are going to have an exciting, energetic, enthusiastic, I'm trying to think of all the adjectives, but by the time we're done, I think we'll have uh, a few more. So going to have a great interview with Adam, Adam Gaynor sitting here. What's up, Steven? Appreciate you coming down. Of course. Um, This is going to be an entrepreneurial interview, which we do, but also a creative interview. And for those of you who don't know Adam or or recognize his name, by the time we're done with this, you will. But I'm not going to jump right into, oh, here's Adam and look at all the great stuff he's done. We're going to sort of tease it out of him as we go, which I, I think will be a lot of fun. So Adam is in the music career, was, um is doing something different now that we will not only get to, there's a little hint over our shoulder in one of the shots that will, other other shoulder, there we go. I just got scared. Eventually we'll get there, but um, say hello, Adam, and then talk to us a little bit about your creative journey of how you got into music. Not giving anything away, just give give us some background on creativity. First of all, hey guys, nice to see you. Stephen, thank you so much for having me on the, I wanted to really define what podcast means. That was really my question of the day. Where did this come from? What is what is the word? What does this represent? Pod, cast. I know I'm supposed to talk about myself, but what is that? Like, who came up with pod? What does pod have to do with? But I don't know. We're sitting here looking at, at Eagle. We're at the, I don't know. the I'm waiting Groove for Radio the Station downtown. I gotta go. I gotta go figure this I, out. I'm gonna go Google. I created my own name for something called a doing? short cast yeah. when I'm doing three to five minute videos, but I do not know what a podcast I is. I like a short cast blast. There we go. Thank you. This I like is what it. I, hey. This is what I do. Creativity America. Exactly. This is what we do. <laughs> anyway, I started to um, play guitar when I was a little kid. My sister was playing guitar in the house, and I got jealous because she got too much attention. What's your definition of little kid? What age? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, I was... Uh, this, this tall doesn't count. We're, I know. We're I was, I'm trying to show the people. <laughs> the, there's a thing. Um, I was like 12, 11, 11. Okay. 11. 11 and then right. she's getting way too much attention for me in the house because I was like waving, look at me, look at me. But all of a sudden she's playing guitar, James Taylor, the house is in a, in a, so I'm like, I stole her guitar, went to the local school, took free lessons. And then <laughs> I realized, man, this is like, okay. And then people started listening to me and finally I got my family back. You know, it's all about making sure <laughs> my sister, sorry, Sherry. I was about <laughs> me making sure that I had enough attention for me. And it's very selfish. And then um, basically from there, there was one big moment in my life when I was like 12, when I lived in New York, before I moved to Florida, I was listening to an Eagles Desperado album. And there was this weird song nobody ever heard of called Outlaw Man. And I was playing acoustic guitar and I had my turntable because I'm an old guy. Back in the day, we had these things called records and turntables. 1963. And, uh, yeah, by the way, you can't see it in the picture, but there's literally my birthday. We can on see it, one of the shots. Yeah. It's so crazy. It is yeah. the, the coolest thing. <laughs> there, there ever. It is. Um, so, so I was playing and then I was playing to this record and as a 12 year old, I'm like, Oh my God, I sound like the Eagles. Like I could play these two or three chords and I'm like, maybe I can do this. It was the first moment in my life that I was like, and by the way, if you flash back into the edit now and we just clipped into me back yeah. as a 12 year old, it was probably horrible, but I thought it was in great. Your head, you were great. It was the best thing I've ever heard. And then from there I was like, I'm going to play more and practice more and then it just became a focal point of this is what I'm going to do from that earliest age. And so that was 12. When did you think or realize you wanted to be in a band and how did the band aspect come along? That's the weirdest part. So basically I was a closet musician per se. I played acoustic guitar. I wrote horrible songs, like (laughs) things that you can't even imagine. I can sing them, but I don't want to have people turn off yet. We'll do that at the end. Um, And at some point I thought I was going to be a singer songwriter, which is the joke of what we'll get into later of what I wound up doing. So it was really about me writing songs, thinking I was going to be an artist. I don't know, James Taylor. I don't know what the heck I was doing later. Maybe Adam Duritz of Counting Crows ish. (laughs) And then Um, I had two bands as an adult, but like two gigs ever. Like one was like a weird club 
and not even really getting paid. And one was like a battle of the bands. And I again, just playing by myself, recording by myself. And then other stuff happened, which gets into the later so story. So let's, let's go back. So this is Pass Me and 12. Pass this Me and 12. 12 and a half. First two bands. What were the Just names kidding. of the first two bands? Do you remember? I know one of them. Okay. What's um, one of them? One was Crossfire. Shout out to my, my band mates back in the uh, in the 80s, Freddie and Mark, who I'll send you guys the links to this. Um, I still keep in touch with them on Facebook, which is the best because they got really upset when I had a great career. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, that they're, no, they didn't. They're, I'm so proud of you guys. Freddie makes these amazing guitars, which, which whatever. So, um, but yeah. Well, so the, therein was our segue. Either you purposely yes. did it or it sort of spun out. Right. Which led you to a, what some would classify as a great historic and potentially award, not only award worthy, yeah. but let's, let's call it, what's, what's Hall of Fame. It could be yeah. Hall of Fame wow. worthy. Yeah. Wow. Let's, could let's be. see. We're not gonna give the, We're the not giving it name away. yet, Are but how out? did that yeah. band come along? Where what was the genesis of that? And then we'll obviously talk about what you did within that. So here's the first lesson to the kids at home, and kids or anybody under 50 years old, you're a, you're a kid, you're a child to me. <laughs> so so anybody. So the the deal that I did was I was living in Miami at the time, and I had to say to myself, man, I'm playing guitar. I'm almost 30 years old, or at the time I was like 23. So, so, but I'm like, how am I going to get a break? I know. Well, the the, the break came when I was 30. 30. Yeah, the sure. break came when I was 30. But at 23, I Historically said. Historically faster than 10 years. It's a really crazy story. <laughs> Nobody at my age, but we're going to get into that later. That should have made it at that age. So at 23, I'm like, how am I going to in South Florida where there's, excuse me, where there's very little opportunity. Mike Gloria Stefan was there. The Miami Sound Machine was there. The Bee Gees had just moved away. It was like, so I put myself answering phones at a recording studio is the quickest version I could tell you. So I would be around this famous studio called Criteria Records. Shout out to all my guys, Trevor and Margie and everyone I love there. Um, and and it, I put myself answering phones so people like Lenny Kravitz and Collective Soul and Julio Iglesias and Mariah Carey. Wow. Anybody who came to South Florida went there. So I knew that if at least I was sitting at the front desk answering phones, I would be in touch with the producers and the people. I could record on my part time. And that was the beginning of me making a decision like, should you get a job in the mailroom, kids here in LA who want to work <laughs> for an agency? Or, yeah, you should because you got to get in the building. I had to get in the building. If I sat at home and worked another odd job, who's going to find me or how am I going to find yeah. the other people? So I sacrificed my life. Good for you. For great, 23 to 30 answering phones. And then. How did, who did you meet first? How did the band come about? Was, I don't know enough of the history. So give us a little bit of how it started, what was there, and then obviously disclose the name and let's, let's talk about what happened from sure. that point forward. So I was, I was recording some music and a band called Collective Soul was in the studio. And there was a producer named Matt Serletic, um, who was their producer. And long story ended is I was playing my guitar outside of one of their studios and, um, one of the engineers heard, told the singer Ed about me playing these great pop rock songs. And also the producer got a hold of me. So all of a sudden I sent my cassette to two people. And the joke is uh, the singer turned me on to his management company. I read this crazy contract and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And then the producer calls and says he wants to send me a demo of some guys in Orlando putting together a band. Very long story. Story ended is I went to go meet the guys in the band. This is like, there's such a long story. I'm trying to condense yeah. it. And end of the whole story is it turns out the guy that I went to go meet was Rob Thomas. The producer introduced me to him. We got along great. I had to go back for another audition. Very fast version is that became the beginning of Matchbox 20. And, and there we have it. The big reveal is Adam was one of the early wins in Matchbox 20. Yeah. But it me. started as a 12 year old closet musician. And then... Yeah taken the job to get into the industry and still have the same guitar skills yeah. as that 12 year old and i love it and so let's let's talk briefly about that historical arc of matchbox 20 and okay. then obviously i want to get into the things you're doing now which I, I know you're super excited about what would you say for somebody looking to get in what were the two biggest things that surprised you 
within the industry? Because Matchbox 20 obviously had huge success. Sure. What were the two things that surprised you most that you weren't expecting? I mean, I, I don't know what I didn't expect. Uh, you know, I was so lucky that I got my break at 30 years old that I think anytime you get that break, you have a lot more street smarts than maybe a 18 or 19 year old kid. So I think the things that I learned super quick are it's not about how good looking you are or how good you sing or or how good your band sounds. It's literally, I had a lawyer in Miami teach me when I was going over my first contract, the three most important things in the music biz are the song, the song, and the song. And I did not understand what he meant. And I was kind of like, I don't get it because you can have a beautiful singer that writes crappy songs and eventually it's not, you know, yeah, he looks great, but then it died. Yeah. So until I started working with Rob Thomas and realized that we eventually produced like 12 hits in a decade and were one of the most played bands on radio and Billboard magazine for that literal decade, I really got a quick lesson of what was important for the band. Yeah, we rehearsed like hell, made sure we sounded great, made sure we had a good live show, but really it was about the songwriting for a band. That's the most important thing that you have to understand is it doesn't matter how cool you are or the gear that you're buying, if you can't sit with an acoustic guitar and play on a piano a great song for someone, it's really hard to kind of navigate this giant career. Now, the last thing I want to say, because yeah. I'm rambling, is I always encourage kids who play me eccentric music in their basement, their friends and family love it. Look, if that's what you want to do, super fantastic. I will never argue with that. But if you're trying to do music business, there's a reason they call it the music business. You have to meet the industry somewhere to get massive exposure or some yeah. appeal. So there's a there's a cross between and, both. And I, I find that fascinating. I like you sharing it because, yeah, I, I love the entrepreneurial side because I'm not in entertainment. Sure. But not only does that resonate with me on the business side, you guys can't see, I always point to to Eagle, we're at the Groove Radio Stations, downtown LA, Swedish Eagle over here. He's smiling, he's nodding he's his head, he's doing this with Adam because he's in the industry and he understands. But the, the creation of that is what was really important and I think that's led you into the career that, that you have now. So Matchbox 20 obviously was, was great. When did you know you wanted to do something different? What was the transition out of music into what you're doing now? And I want to talk about that. So what was the transition when you knew, hey, music's going to be something that I've done, but I want to do something different? Yeah, so we we did, we sold 25 million records, had like three Grammy nominations, two American Award, award nominations, couldn't be more proud award of the winning, that's what I said. Award Paul, nominated. We award lost nominated. everyone. We, we were like, I'm Words the happiest matter. loser. Words I'm matter. literally <laughs> the best loser ever. Um, and there is a thing about saying it's it's okay to be nominated. I think eventually I'd like an Oscar, to be honest. I actually yeah. want the physical Oscar. That's like my dream dream. But I think you get these really cool Tiffany Grammy medallions. They're like, they look like a bronze medal from the Olympics on this beautiful court. So they're like in my office. They're cool. So yeah. you, you get to say you got that. So... The transition was, um, at some point on the bus, I started dabbling with Photoshop. I'm not an artistic drawn person, but I started making like these weird cartoons and things that I'm like, this is kind of cool and this is super weird. And <laughs> I, just, I just realized I might have somewhat of an ability to create other content like not just music. Some people are lifers. Like some people are like, are your idols Keith Richards and Jimi Hendrix? And I'm like, I think my guys are like Walt Disney, Rod wow. Sterling, Steve Jobs. Like I'm the anti-musician's musician, but I'm so proud of getting that first dream out of the sky, throwing it in my knapsack. And I'm like, I want to climb other mountains. Yeah. Like I want to do more. And as a musician, did you consider yourself a creative or an artist or an entertainer? Because it sounds like you had more of a creation gene that was manifesting into music and now it's transitioned into what you're doing currently. Yeah, yeah it was. it's tricky. I'm not exactly sure um, what you mean, but I, I obviously had, I had. I always have like a director's eye, even like wanting to do more with our music videos or wanting to produce part of our stage show or do something else that I didn't really have a lot of access to when I was in the band. So I had this creative desire to do more and you know in between records we had a lot of downtime like sometimes we were lucky enough to have like eight months off and you can do whatever you want so eventually I just started building these weird things I wound up finding like a freelance artist started designing more and then realized I actually can produce talent into creating other worlds that I can explore and eventually try to monetize and again either 
you're doing that subconsciously or out of habit because you're a professional, that's going to lead us to what you're doing now because you talk about being creative mm -hmm. and the company name is Looped or... It's a uh, watermelon. It's a hint. It's a hint of watermelon. It's a hint I'm Adam of watermelon. Gaynor for hint. It's hint watermelon. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, I asked if I could drink the bottle out there. Now I'm doing it. It's hint. It's hint uh, watermelon. It's infused with this. It's like a eyedropper. You boop, and it's a hint. Just, okay. But you said earlier you'd rather yeah. have some or none. I gotta be honest with you, hint. If you're gonna put the flavor in there, give me some flavor. But I'm still. It's hint. I'm, lo I'm loving you. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So what we're gonna plug. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Is the current... Oh, no, this is great. I said it's going to go all <laughs> over. Creationville. Mm -hmm. Creationville.com yeah. is the current... That's it. ...iteration of Adam Gaynor. And as we're talking about plugging, something is sitting in the background. Oh, He's kind maybe. of Little sitting lady. around. It's Edgar Pingleton. It's my buddy. It's uh, This is one of my very first projects that we've been uh, simmering like a little brew. And um, I wrote a children's book that we're going to be releasing actually free next year i'm going to throw it on the interwaves you know the little waves the, the people that well, let's, let's talk about that because yeah. like you said you started having these sort of ideas you related more to the the walt disney's than the yeah, you, I, I don't i was going to try and come up with a musician bob dylan's i, I again i'm more business wise how did you come up with creationville what's what is it really doing now and how does Edgar over our shoulder fit into the current business of what you're doing? So basically, Creationville, I like to say that we're one gazillionth of DreamWorks. So we've, <laughs> that's, I think that's fair. I mean, I have like a dollar compared to like a zillion dollars. So that's a gazillionth. Yeah, we have a dream. <laughs> we have a dream. So I've shot some reality shows that we've been pitching. I gave to an agency um, last year that's going very well. Um, a couple of reality things that are in the works. I've, I've just produced our very first animation sizzle, which I'm super excited about. Uh, we'll be pitching that. I'm actually taking some meetings on that this month. And then we're, in the beginning of the year, we're going to try to partner with a digital distributor. Um, and then I have a children's book, Plush Toys, and we're also getting into developing some app stuff. So there's a lot going on with the company, okay. but I'm trying to focus on two or three things to launch for the new year because I'm one person with some freelance artists and animator people. So it's a lot for me to focus on at one, and I'm trying not to be super scattered. No, you're doing great. It, it, again, it's creationville.com. You can follow Adam at Adam Gaynor on Twitter. And I made a... And the Instagram. And Instagram. The Instagram. That's my thing. Yeah. So if Instagram. Let's let's talk about Edgar for a minute yeah. or Eddie as you call him. Because Edgar. I, I made a comment as we were setting up for, for the shot. Yeah. I noticed how he props up very elegantly. Yeah. Great posture. As an entrepreneur, sure. you said something that I found fascinating because that doesn't happen by accident. Yeah. Talk about the design sure. of just the elements to even get a plush toy to sit up. Yeah, it's amazing. Like when you when you think about where you come from and what you're trying to do, if you're trying to start a business, I think for anybody, if you're trying to open a floral shop, you have to learn about different flowers and different environments, about what can, you can sell where you are, and you have to really heavily research. So I started manufacturing Edgar with a couple companies overseas, and you know everything from when they would send me the first, uh, I like the first version of Edgar, it was so. It was so mutated. It was actually frightening. And I'm just like, I had to sit and re-Photoshop it. I'm like, that's not even my toy. I don't know what character. Yeah. You know, it could have been Mickey Mouse. I don't know. It didn't look like <laughs> Edgar. Sorry, Disney. I didn't buy a plug for you. By the way, hint. It's hint water. It's just a hint of watermelon. So anyway, we're back to plugging everybody in Hollywood. Hey, guys. So, um, so basically, yeah, you have to like first, you know, you get the samples and then you're like, it doesn't sit up. And then like, we're going to put beans in there and then you have to make sure it's child's proof and child safe. And then you have to get them back and you have to prop them up and make sure. So there was a lot of um, engineering. And I also like, there's a whole other project. We're not yeah. going to go on a tangent, but there was another massive project that I was patenting that really was like engineering, developing, patenting. So there is a lot of process that goes into, you can draw and you can be creative, but if you want to start manufacturing and making toys, you got to get in the trenches. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lesson there because a lot of people, you know, whether it's what you did at Matchbox, they see this end result and product and they look at that and and think it's easy. And what they don't realize is, I'm gonna use the phrase you said off camera, 
took a lot of beans in the butt to make that thing sit up properly. <laughs> it, did. it did, and I did not count all the beans, but I'm sure there's a bunch. There's a bunch of beans in the there's butt. a bunch of beans in the butt. With Creationville now, what's the story of Edgar? How does it fit into the direction of the company, and, and what would you want the audience to know about Edgar and Creationville? Um, I think just just follow me out on the Adam Gaynor Instagram, uh, G-A-Y-N-O-R. I love doing that. That was the biggest plug I'll have all day. And, um, <laughs> and then we're going to release the book next year, and then we're going to have plans for an e-commerce store and some gear for Edgar. And if the kids love the book, we're going to have a lot of toys. I'm also going to do a simultaneous viral uh, YouTube channel uh, for Edgar and, and for myself as well. It's going to be a little bit of a fun little process for me to be creative, some self-promotion and some just me having fun. Yeah. You know what I noticed? What's that? The whole interview. Um, this is a thing that I know to do better. So instead of looking at the monitor yeah. or into the camera, I'm looking at my monitor. So if you see me looking audience slightly askew, not really at you, but through you, I apologize. Now I'm focused <laughs> on you guys, but I was kind of up here. You were up, up above. Yeah, yeah. we'll see how looking, that looks. Looking a little snooty. Yeah, no, now we I got have, you. I'm locked we'll in. Down. We've, I see you, you guys. Know, great stuff with the studio here yeah. at Groove Radio. We've got monitors everywhere monitors. we've got palm trees in the corner we have the the lp covers i guess is what it used to be called i i noticed from a a timing standpoint i say things are age appropriate if you heard it earlier adam sent out his cassettes yeah cassettes some of the audience what may not know what a cassette is it's like but a thing a plastic thing. <laughs> it's a thing it's a plastic piece of plastic it's got a tape in there and you used to put this in this machine called the cassette player <laughs> And uh, you would push a button, like a literal physical. You'd have to push it down. It wasn't like a phone thing. You'd have to. You'd have to. You'd have to be a lot stronger than we are today yeah. to push that button to play. And and not only is technology changed. Yeah. Let's talk about with Creationville because some sure. of it is animation. Yeah. Right. So how are you integrating animation in, and what does that look like in terms of how it's going to integrate with the reality show and? Sure. What you're trying to do. I mean, it does. That's why I said we're like, we're all over the place as far as creative is concerned. So trying to focus it all down. I had two kids of mine. I'm sorry I call them kids. They're younger than me. Anybody younger, literally an hour, I call you a kid. So I apologize. I had two beautiful, talented artist animators um, underneath me. And um, we were just working on the animation together. So it's more of a, a young children's process. I do want to do a really cool adult like HBO-ish, okay. another plug. Hi, guys, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> a, a, a more of an adult series that's really funny, and I'm so excited to do that, but I'm going to try to not not be all over the place as far as people's focus. I want to get Edgar out, and then the other animation process is uh, or project is a different project for really, really young kids. It's really beautiful. I'm really proud of it. And and again, the, the, the premise of the podcast is called The Bullseye Guy, so it's yeah. about being targeted. What's the target demographic for Edgar sure. and what do you need for it to move forward? Again, thinking from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you've got a product, mm -hmm. you have the story, you have some of the animation and things. Sure. What's the demographic for this and what are the next two or three steps for you to move forward? What's amazing is with Edgar, when I, just like my band's demographic, the lesson I learned, we were, we were going through a lot of weaving. And one of the things, one of the lessons, which was something I found really interesting is we had 16 year old girls to 40 year old professional women listening to our band. And I realized it's not easy to create a demographic like that. It, it happens yeah. just because of what you do. You can't say, I'm going to create a specific project. We got very fortunate because of the kinds of songs our singer was writing and what we were producing music wise. Edgar is probably going to be built from, you know, it could be five to 12 years old. Um, there's lessons which are parallel to my life about not just hoping something happens, not just wishing upon a star, but actually going out and figuring out how to make it happen. And that's what I'm trying to instill to the kids, the real actual kids, so that you don't just ask for something. You don't just hope. Like everybody, artists that I meet are like, I just want this so bad. I want this so bad. And look, I get it. I wanted it really bad too. But you also have to figure out a way to get it to happen. You have to find your path. You have to make adjustments. You have to work really, really hard to try to get some mountain to move. So when I bring this out to the book comes out, which is done, um, it teaches kids like, if I want to be a famous baseball player, I got to go out every day for 15 minutes. That's it. Just go out every day for 15 minutes, start playing yeah. and practicing. And eventually you'll say, oh my God, I have some talent at this. Maybe this is something I can pursue. But you can't just like hope it happens. And parents understand that. And the book is super soft and sweet. It doesn't condition you to go out and work and work and work. It just says, have fun at what you're doing, but go out and actually 
try at a young age, if you can understand the basic principles of being successful at practicing your guitar or going out and playing baseball, it's a great tool for, especially our day and age of children that are just glued to devices sure. and aren't really, they're, they're starting to lose it. I think a little bit, no disrespect, children of the earth, but we're, they're, <laughs> they're losing a little bit of that grit of going out and fighting to create something for themselves or having a focus really. And, and how much of Creationville and the lessons of Edgar are you pulling from your own history and, and your yeah. own life lessons? I mean, that's a great question. That's the book is based on me doing what I had to do to make something happen for myself and not to sit in my apartment back in Miami in the days hoping something would happen, but figuring out my path, which was I have to get around the people that I want to be, which are these professional musicians sure. and these bands. So getting to the recording studio and sitting there as a glorified phone boy, that's what I was, um, until I was 30 years old and almost had a nervous breakdown um, <laughs> because I'm like, mom, like this is, am I being like super crazy? Like that was my one nervous breakdown at 30. I basically cried to my mom. I love saying this, look, it's honesty. Yeah. And I literally was losing my mind. Like, am I being like, I think this is going to happen, but am I being crazy? And she's passed. I love my mom so much. But um, her advice, which I'll never forget, was like, look, Ad, you don't want to be 50 years old and not have tried, yeah. like not really given it everything you can to really try to fulfill your dream. I know so many people have to settle. You get families, you get kids, you, you can't figure out a way to keep your dream intact. And part of my brand, go moving to the adult consulting later on, is trying to figure out ways to enable you to still live your dreams and still find that 15 minutes a day with your children, with your spouse, that gives you that creative freedom to try to do something passionate. That's, we're all creative humans. Yeah. And if you, if you kill that spirit of you, then that's why people like hate their job and they hate their lives because they don't have the freedom to be able to pursue something that's a dream. Even if you want to write a little book, find 15 minutes a day, get started, it. figure it out. Yeah. And I don't think this is going to give away the plot yeah. of Edgar, but does Edgar have a talent? Does he have a dream? What's How do the life lessons weave into what Edgar's going to be when he grows up? Which, by the way, grab yeah. him again. I think you need to... Yeah. So Edgar's pull, got a lot of beans pull, in his butt. That's all I know. For those of you listening on the, the podcast, that's fine. We also are on YouTube, thanks to the guys at Groove Radio. So on the YouTube video, you'll get to see... Where's, where's our main show? There we go. There's Edgar. Look at his... What was the what was the the aspect with the eye and the design? What was the creation so, behind? The idea of Edgar is that he's not perfect, and it's okay to give something unconditional love that's not perfect. Wow, and that's a very nice. That I want to teach the kids is he's just not perfect, and people want to know what's wrong with his eye, and I ask, what do you think happened to his eye, and let, we leave it at that. So you let the kids build a story. Yeah, they can figure it out for themselves, but they know that when they hold Edgar, they get unconditional love. And yeah. that's all you need to know about a human being is some people may not look perfect, but that's okay. So maybe that's his talent is to bring unconditional love into the world and the that universe. Is, that is his universal message. Yeah. As, as, as you move forward then, what's the next chapter for you with Creationville? What are the next steps? I know you talked about a, a bunch of different things. Is it really moving the character forward? Is it getting the book out? What's, what's coming next on the horizon that, the people that follow you at Adam Gaynor on Instagram, what what can they expect to come next? Lunch is the first thing. I'm starving, by the way. I just want to, this was, I was told there was going to be shrimp cocktail and a little bottle of champagne, but I'll tell you what I got. You I got, got him water. It's a touch of watermelon. It's a little hint of, it's freshness. So I have the engineer group laughing with my Enna girls and they're laughing to death. Um, so I, I, what's next is um, we're going to build a platform for Edgar to release him, revamp the website. So it's Edgar centric. That's a good okay. word I just made yeah. up. And then um, next year, probably January, February, I'll put the word out on Instagram that his book is available for free downloads. And then um, we'll start the launch of him. That's the, that's the mass project. At the same time, we're going to be looking for digital partners for the children's project. I'm not ready to kind of say the name of that yet, yeah. but it's, it's super fun and awesome. And I'm just terribly proud of the visuals of that. Um, and that's that project. And then I don't want to get so scattered all over because I can talk like about 20 projects, but those are the two focal points. There's a little app thing I want to do for something else, but we'll get, you know, I'm slowly working, weaving around when I have time to work on that as well. Perfect. So Adam Gaynor, musician at 12, phone boy at 30. in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> but again, Matchbox 20, great career. 
Great Ark, and now with Creationville doing some amazing things. So follow him at Adam Gaynor on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram's the better platform, probably a little more visual. And uh, if you're interested in getting involved, I'm not going to oversell, but I know he would love some great, talented people on the team. Sure. Reach out to Adam for sure. And thank you for tuning in again. Steve and me, the bullseye guy.com at the famous Groove Radio Stations downtown LA. Tune in next week again. Steve and me, the bullseye guy.com.